Stokely, a life, has been called the definitive biography of Stokely Carmichael, the man who popularized the phrase black power and led the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as the SNCC. The recipient of fellowships from Harvard University's Charles Warren Center, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the Ford Foundation, his essays have appeared in the Journal of American History, the Chronicle Review, the New York Times, the Black Scholar, Souls, and American Historical Review. Dr. Joseph is a frequent contributor to Newsweek, The Root, and Rooters, and his articles, op-eds, and book reviews have been published in newspapers from the Washington Post to the New York Times. Dr. Joseph's commentary has also been featured on National Public Radio, The Colbert Report, PBS, and MSNBC. Everyone, join me in welcoming Dr. Peniel Joseph. Dr. Thank Joseph, you, Dr. it is quite a pleasure to have you join us this evening um, for you to be able to speak with us about your latest work, and that is The Sword and the Shield. And it's quite a timely work, given our discussions about, in essence, where are the politics of Black people in this moment? Mm -hmm. and also thinking about race, discrimination, and what that means for a theory of democracy, but also what is the practice of democracy. And so if you could help us think about the significance of Black leadership in the 1950s and 1960s, how might you characterize that? That is, can you tell us a little bit more about the state of Black life in the United States at that time, and why was Black leadership needed, if any? And what did it do for navigating Black people's lives in that political era? Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Nunnally. That's a great question. Uh, it's a broad question in the sense that when we think about Black life in post-war America, it's both uh, racially segregated. Um, there's going to be endemic poverty. There is a mini carceral state there com comparatively and Malcolm Little is going to get caught in that 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 smaller carceral state. Um, black life chances are less than their white counterparts. Uh, so black people in a lot of ways are non-citizens in a democracy you don't have classes of citizens so when people say second and third class I always push back against that. You're either a citizen or you're not. Um, very few have voting rights so uh, as, as you know, Dr. Nunley, there's going to be Black folks in New York, in Chicago, Oscar DePriest, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., um, who are voting. But the bulk of Black folks, um, until really after 1970, are still in the South. So when you think about the 1950s and 60s, even as that migration is taking place, we have millions who are sort of trapped in the South. They're trapped in Mississippi. They're trapped in Alabama. And I don't want to go too far in that sense saying that they're living rich lives. These are people who are extraordinarily gifted uh, Black people. And by gifted, I don't ever necessarily even mean um, formally trained, but I mean people like Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, people who are, uh, you know, Rulesville, Mississippi, people who are, who are um, uh, just brilliant organic intellectuals, to use the Gramscian term. You know, these are folks who uh, can teach all of us about democracy and about citizenship and dignity and human rights. Um, but in the context of the 1950s and 60s, it's a very much still a patriarchal leadership organ organization where Black women are doing uh, grassroots leadership. Uh, they are, um, Belinda Robnett has called them bridge leaders in the book, How Long, How Long by Gloria Richardson. And I've been, just as a scholar, I've been in the space of Black feminism for uh, 28 years now, um, having uh, been a, a, one of my specialties with Sonia Sanchez, who was, who was my one of my advisors at Temple University. So for me, you know, I'm always um, thinking and still reading in that way. So it's whether it's uh, Audre Lorde or uh, uh, Ida B. Wells or Anna Julia Cooper or Barbara Smith or Lorraine Hansberry or, um, you know, uh, Amani Perry and, and uh, Barbara Ransby uh, and, and Beth Ritchie uh, and, um, you know, uh, this bridge call my back, uh, but some of us are brave. Uh, Tony K, Tony K Bambara, uh, Alice Walker, uh, Tony Morrison, 
um, but also Tressie McMillan Cottom, um, who's actually coming to the center next Thursday. And I teach Thick, I teach Eloquent Rage, I teach uh, Development Arrested. Um, so I teach all of this stuff. But so when we think about it, there's, there's multiple levels of leadership. And where Malcolm and Martin come in um, is really within the context of the Cold War and Cold War liberalism. Because in a lot of ways, as we've seen, uh, there was this long civil rights movement and also this long black power movement. Because uh, the historian Jacqueline Dodd Hall has talked about a long civil rights movement, uh, which I appreciate. But in some ways, the, the, the framing of that movement is sort of, sort of just interracial trade union, uh, labor, uh, uh, civil rights activism. So you can include A. Philip Randolph, but you're not really including people who are connected to Marcus Garvey uh, including um, Black women, people, peace movement of Ethiopia, which Keisha Blaine writes about, right? Uh, you're not necessarily including even the Black women who Eric McDuffie writes about in Sojourning for Truth or Sojourning, Sojourning for Freedom in terms of these left Black women. Dale Gore writes about them too, right? So there's this rich history. And, and when you think about um, that long Black power movement, that's what really Malcolm is going to tap into uh, and that Black Power movement is connected to uh, Garveyism, is connected to um, aspects of, when we think about Garveyism, there's a left and right and moderate wings of Garveyism. So there's the African Blood Brotherhood, which people like uh, Minka Makalani, my colleague here um, at UT writes about, but there's, there's also uh, more, more emigrationist and sort of civilizationist strains of Garveyism as well, right? Um, and so when we think about uh, this idea of, of uh, radical Black political self-determination, Malcolm is coming out of both the anti-colonial tradition of Alphaeus Hutton and the Rosa Guy and the Vicky Garvins and these different folks. Um, but at the same time, he's coming out of the nationalist tradition and the Pan-Africanist tradition of uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association which the Nation of Islam is just basically a derivation of, you know, um, and, and of the Moorish Science Temple as well. You know, the Nation of Islam is coming out of the Moorish, uh, Timothy Drew, who we might know as Noble Drew Ali, um, coming out of that tradition. So when we think about the 1950s and 60s, you've got the, the Malcolm X's or the Malcolm Littles, who's born in Omaha, Nebraska, who's lived in Wisconsin, who's lived in East Lansing, um, his mother, Louise Norton Little, and his father, Earl, um, are pioneering Garveyites in the 1920s. Malcolm is born in 1925. And in a lot of ways, what they're trying to do is escape the Jim Crow segregation of the South, Georgia, where his father's from. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a very complicated story uh, because his father leaves his first family. His father has a wife and three children and really leaves. Um, and then has, ends up having seven children with his second wife, right? Um, and, and so when we think about where Malcolm is coming from in the state of the 1950s and 60s, initially he's a child of basically the Great Depression, right? And so is Dr. King, but Dr. King is coming from um, Sweet Auburn Avenue. He's coming out of this black church tradition where it's really his mother's side that are the um, well-to-do side. His father's coming from sharecropping folks. And, and without having married his mother, Daddy King would have never <laughs> achieved much in the material sense of the word achievement, right? You know, so that's real. Like, so he owes everything to Alberta King and <laughs> the fact that she, <laughs> she chooses him. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the truth of the matter. But within the context of patriarchy, they don't discuss that. You know, uh, they, they act like he, he is to the manner born. But when you think about Dr. King, he grows up in segregated Georgia. Uh, he grows up in Jim Crow, Georgia. One of the anecdotes in the book is that both Dr. King and Malcolm X both have an experience with Gone with the Wind. Malcolm is 14 when he sees it in Mason, Michigan, and he says he feels like crawling under the seat when they're doing all the racial stereotypes, Butterfly McQueen, Hattie McDaniel. And uh, King is appalled at the premiere because when it premieres in Atlanta in 1939, uh, you know, his parents have explained to him just how racist this is. And it's the number one box office film. You, you know what I mean? So they're, they're, really, they're really coming of age in, in a very, very racist white supremacist culture. 
But when we think about the 1950s and 60s, um, there's, there's a few things happening. We're seeing the post-war boom, you know, economically. Um, we're seeing a push uh, for um, Black citizenship and dignity. But that push has been constrained because of the Cold War. So instead of seeing people like uh, the Ella Bakers, who's still going to re reinvent herself as one of the founders, or really the founder of SNCC, um, but instead of seeing the Ella Bakers and the Paul Robesons and the Du Boises, you start seeing Black preachers um, precisely because so many people have been deported. C.L.R. James is deported. Claudia Jones is deported. Uh, Hollywood sets up a fiction and fantasy about the blacklist where it just affected white straight writers. <laughs> and and the, the, the blacklist um, really impacted black folks too, you know, because we, we, we were um, the most political group in the United States. And some of us were part of communists and Marxist leftists, but some of us were part of trade unions and just part of black nationalists and pan-Africanist, black feminist organizations. And those are the folks who are going to be hit the hardest, right? And so from that perspective, Malcolm and Martin come of age in a domestic political uh, confines that has actually grown more narrow uh, than the previous decade before their political activism. But that globally, there's even bigger opportunities when we think about anti-colonialism globally. You know, Because if the US stays the trajectory that it's on in the 1940s, even as there's going to be dozens of basically racial pogroms that we call race riots, these are anti-Black racial pogroms um, all throughout the United States in the 1940s. Most of this is um, led by uh, white men who are soldiers, who are ordinary citizens engaging in racial terror in Harlem, in Los Angeles, uh, in Detroit. They call these things zoot suit riots and all that stuff. It's not any of that. I mean, I'm not saying there's no zoot suiters, but what it is, is white male racism. <laughs> so that, that, that's what it is. And though, you know, what's interesting about that score, um, Dr. Nunnally, is that Malcolm calls it what it is. Malcolm is constantly um, making an argument uh, that white America uh, and placing them on trial for a series of crimes against black humanity. So that's what Malcolm, Malcolm really identifies the criminal and it's not black people. And in this sense, he's saying the criminal is um, criminal politically, but also morally too. So that's that's his big strength. Um, and and you know, Dr. King, he finds a sweet spot for a time, really for almost a decade, between Montgomery and and Watts, uh, because he he presents himself as sort of this erudite, um, learned. Uh, preacher who's not too black. You know what I mean? Uh, that's why the first New York Times article on him is like, he's listening to classical music with Coretta and Yoki. And, you know, uh, they're eating super white people food. It's like, where's the fried chicken? Where's the stuff? It's like, you know, so it, there's a kind of facade and I see why King did it, but it's until he sort of lets loose and, 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 and lets himself free. That's when we're going to get the radical the revolutionary king, which I think was always in his heart and intellectually, but he never allowed it to be shown in a big, big way. You can have a speech here or there, uh, whereas Malcolm is coming from the lower frequencies of, of, that, of that period. And, and Dr. Joseph, as, as you say that, I really was interested in learning a little bit more about how you feel class played a role in the visions for inclusion that each of these leaders had, in addition to their geographic um, background and their experiences with racism in this different parts of the country. Yeah, it, I think class plays a big role. I mean, I think I look at Malcolm X as this Black um, working class hero. Um, I think that the very fact that he's uh, He's the seventh son of, uh, or the seventh child of, of, of Earl Little and sort of is um, growing up in the Midwest with sort of black Midwestern values, but then gets access starting at the age of 15 to Boston and then Harlem uh, and becomes really this adopted hero of Harlem. Um, he's very, very interesting. 76 months in three different prisons, 
uh, in Massachusetts. So I think when you think about Malcolm X, you know, he had been really a hustler since 12 when you read um, the new Less Pain uh, and Tamara Payne uh, biography, uh, East Lansing Red, Detroit Red. Um, he really identifies with uh, the Black working class and really even, you know, the Black uh, proletariat, right, in, in ways that I think a lot of other leaders uh, have not been able to do. I think Malcolm, sort of the consummate prison intellectual, you know, when we think about um, who amongst us was incarcerated, uh, uh, you know, of course, globally, there's Nelson Mandela. King spends time in prison, um, but he doesn't do hard time in prison like Malcolm does, right? And so uh, when we think about class, that absolutely shapes uh, Malcolm's worldview. His father is killed at an early age. The new bio says that it was the streetcar accident. It wasn't white supremacist. But Malcolm always says that it's white supremacist, so it's important for his narrative. And the family had been um, menaced and threatened by the Klan in, in Nebraska when he was a baby in Omaha. So that definitely shapes his perspective. And I think for King, class shapes his perspective too. I think, you know, um, King is, is uh, relatively speaking to the manor born, a PhD from BU, Crozier Theological Seminary, Morehouse, uh, and getting access to really towering figures like Benjamin Mays, towering figures of sort of the black social gospel and anti-racism. And so I think that from that perspective, King does have a kind of top-down um, leadership model. Uh, it's very patriarchal. Um, he, he's, he's not necessarily open to people like Ella Baker and sort of the leadership of black women, um, unless you're gonna think of Coretta, who obviously is really a close advisor. Uh, so I think class really uh, shapes them. I think in a lot of ways, over time, King starts to embrace some kind of class suicide in the sense of you, you can see that King um, dies without money, uh, does not enrich himself in the movement, uh, neither does Malcolm. So they converge in that idea of really pushing back against um, trying to turn this vocation of racial justice activism into material benefit for themselves. I wondered about this too, um, as far as how this might play out in respectability politics, um, and even what you describe as radical Black citizenship versus radical Black dignity. Uh, can you speak more about that and how you're defining each for the leader? Yeah, you know, I make the argument that that Malcolm is arguing for radical Black dignity at a, at a, on a global scale. And, and Malcolm is very interesting because he's different from Dr. King. Malcolm um, uh, is not defending black humanity to white folks. Uh, he's not interested in it. And that's why I say Malcolm serves as our, uh, he, he's, he's really black America's last prosecuting attorney. He was our prosecuting attorney. That's what he, and he was prosecuting uh, white America, white supremacists. And like I said, I mean, it's very important. Malcolm uses very sophisticated language. He, he, he prosecutes them for a series of crimes that are ongoing against black humanity. So when Malcolm says, you can't put a knife in a person's back nine inches and pull it out six inches and call that progress. He says, you haven't taken the knife out and you haven't even acknowledged the wound. So one of the reasons why Malcolm gets white people very upset, Malcolm is calling them criminals. And he says that the biggest criminal uh, is in the White House. So, so Mal Malcolm is saying that this whole um, society is corrupt and, and the proof, and this is what Malcolm means by radical black dignity. He's talking about abolishing what he calls world white supremacy, right? So Malcolm is not jumping for joy in the aftermath of sit-ins. He's not excited about the Little Rock Central high school crisis, right? And, and here's why. So from Malcolm's perspective, um, if you have dignity and humanity, there's gonna be no need for the military to escort your children into a high school. And he's right, he's right about that. And Malcolm is saying, if you've got dignity and humanity, you don't need to sit in to eat at anybody's lunch counter or to protest to get in anybody's restaurant. So Malcolm makes an argument, this is where he's talking about dignity, that this society, American society is uh, bankrupt. And he says it's ir irredeemable. That's why he makes the argument, why um, would you want to integrate? If you have into, dignity. Um, so Malcolm makes an argument. This is where he's talking oh, about. I'm hearing a, that This I'm hearing society, it. American society, is uh, bankrupt. And he says it's 
I think I'm hearing echo for, for some reason. It's really weird. Um, so <laughs> so we'll, we'll resume. Um, so, so Malcolm is also pushing back against this idea that by um, protesting, uh, you're going to get citizenship in a country that is violently uh, resisting your humanity. So what, what's really interesting when he talks about this idea of radical black dignity, it's really defeating white supremacy and eradicating racism, but it's also black people having political self-determination and understanding their own identity globally. So Malcolm's interested in transforming Negroes into black people who've got a real, real love of Africa, which is why Malcolm spends so much time in Africa in the Middle East, right? So this idea of radical black dignity yeah, it's pride. Yeah, it's Black history and Black identity, but it's really even more than that. It's like Malcolm's the person, this idea of dignity, he's pushing back against Eurocentric Western civilization, perspectives of humanity, of racism, of democracy, of how we're going to solve the world's problems. He's pushing back against that. Um, King, on the other hand, this idea of citizenship uh, King is making an argument for radical Black citizenship. And by that, you know, one of the things I argue is that King serves as a defense attorney in contrast to Malcolm. King is defending uh, Black lives to white people. And then King is also defending, um, you know, white souls to, to Black people. So in a lot of ways, what King uh, does is make an argument that citizenship means more than just the abolition of racial oppression citizenship is going to encompass um, certain rights, not privileges, but rights. So for King, that is going to be housing, it is health care, it's food justice, but it's also the end of racial segregation in public schools and neighborhoods because King realizes that what segregation is, is resource hoarding. You know, the reason why sometimes people even now say, what do you mean by defund the police, reimagine public safety? And you just have to answer to them, uh, the way white folks in suburbs are living right now, right? They, they, they are fine. <laughs> They're fine. And their kids are not getting uh, their heads blown off. Uh, those, those of them who are mentally ill are not being shot uh, live on television. And no one is um, uh, doing no-knock warrants like Brianna Taylor and uh, murdering them uh, while they're sleeping with their boyfriends. So it's, it's pretty easy. And, and so King really, I thought King had a great understanding of what, what, what is segregation? What is the real purpose of segregation? And it's, it's, it's resource hoarding and resource distribution, right? So segregation is a redistrib redistribution of wealth and resources, right? And, and it's a demarcating line, which is why even Blacks who do well, a lot of times they end up in predominantly white areas because that's where the resources are, right? And so they have to struggle and 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 wage a, 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 a battle for their own children's souls if, if they're going to be going to predominantly white universities or having a predominantly white social group and they have to really uh, guard against um, uh, the damage that that can do, right? And so this idea of citizenship and dignity is where they're both coming from, but eventually they converge and see that you really need both. And that's the argument of the sword and the shield. And even the metaphor of the sword and the shield, the reason why I use that is that we usually think of Dr. King as the shield and Malcolm as the sword. And when we look at them and how I do this in this uh, braided uh, intellectual biography is that what you see is that they both are the political sword and the political shield, both of them. So Malcolm utilizes his razor sharp, sharp intellect and uh, Malcolm's not only criticizing white people, he's really, um, he's really criticizing in a loving way black people because he makes the argument that black people don't understand that liberation is gonna reside in the last place they ever care to look, which is their own traditions and value systems and history. That's what he's saying. So Malcolm would push back against this whole idea of pathologizing the black family, of pathologizing uh, black, uh, you know, women and men and children, and say that that's where we're going to find our utmost strength, and those are the folks we should elevate, right? And so Malcolm's a small C conservative in the sense that he's interested in African traditions, 
He's interested in black traditions. He's interested in black intelligence. Uh, he's interested in black beauty and strength and determination. But what Malcolm does is he castigates black people who are less interested. <laughs> so Malcolm, and the reason why black people still love Malcolm is that they understood he was doing it based on love. He was doing it based, Malcolm wasn't ever criticizing you because he hated you or he disrespected you. He would criticize you because he expected a lot more from you, from us. And again, we have to remember Malcolm X is um, um, imploring us to call ourselves black uh, and African and Afro-American uh, when most of us were out of our minds uh, with white supremacy and we wanted Negro to be capitalized with an end. I mean, it's embarrassing, but it's our truth. It's our story. It's our story. Cause now we can be like, hey, you know, we got the black power symbol and, you know, black lives matter. And we've got our sisters and brothers leading the fight. Um, but no, so that that's where Malcolm, Malcolm is the shepherd. Malcolm is the shepherd. And, and there are millions, tens of millions of lost sheep in the United States. <laughs> tens of millions, right? And so, so that's what's so interesting with Malcolm. And then King, you know, King, I think one of the things I argue with King is that we, 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 we set up a world where King is everybody's teddy bear. And, and you know, King would give the, the most racist white folks uh, alive today in 2020, because there's even more racist white folks in 2020 than in 1965. There's more, not less, like they keep telling you. There's more, which is why the country is going down the tubes. Um, so when we think King wouldn't give these racists a big hug, what we see is that King uh, is this vociferous anti-racist who takes on this prophetic tradition. So when we think about King, um, um, especially after Malcolm's assassination, but Malcolm's, assass Malcolm's life is what helps King get to that, to that point, right? Uh, because Malcolm had enabled King to play good cop to Malcolm's bad cop, right? Um, but after Malcolm um, is assassinated, there's no one there to do that, you know, even including with Kwame Ture and Stokely Carmichael and King and, and Stokely are very, very close. So King has to become this Jeremiah figure, this Amos figure. He becomes, you know, Paul on the road to Damascus. Uh, the Roman soldier Saul becomes Paul um, um, when King realizes which Malcolm had always told him about this searing American racial wilderness, uh, King comes to realize the depth and the breadth of, of racism once he goes to Watts, you know, he goes to Watts. He had seen it in Harlem, he had seen it in Birmingham, he had seen it other places in Letter from Birmingham Jail, he talks about white moderates who want, um, you know, an unjust peace uh, instead of, uh, 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 you know, a, a more tension-filled search for justice. He was in Harlem in 64 and he met up with police chiefs who Malcolm X had tried to negotiate with to end police brutality and he failed in New York and Los Angeles just like Malcolm had failed. Um, but Watts really becomes a turning point and then he goes to Chicago and really he has an essay beyond the Los Angeles riots uh, where he talks about using nonviolence as a peaceful sword. Uh, massive civil disobedience. This is King's words. And so what's so interesting for me about King is that Malcolm had criticized the March on Washington as the farce on Washington because he wanted them to immobilize the entire city. By 65, King is saying they're going to do just that. So when we look at the last three years of King's life in the last two chapters, the radical King, the revolutionary King, what you see is that King is stalking the country uh, like a man on fire. King is saying that the halls of the US Congress are running wild with racism. Uh, it's King who's telling the American Psychological Association the biggest threat to American democracy is, uh, is white folks and, and white folks are producing chaos in the streets. And then they're saying that there would be peace but for the chaos that they're producing. So King anticipated um, Trumpism and anticipated uh, you know, this, this era of massive, massive lies uh, and anti-democracy that's rooted in anti-Black racism, rooted in racial slavery, right? Uh, but Malcolm had been the first person to talk about these crimes. But by 1968, when King is organizing the Poor People's Campaign, he's in Marks, Mississippi, which is the poorest zip code in the United States. And he's in tears once he sees all these Black folks, these Black mothers and fathers and kids, kids with no shoes, kids with no shoes. They have no blankets uh, when, when the cold comes. This is really rough stuff. 
And King tells them using the language of Malcolm X that it's a crime the way they're living. This is Dr. King who says this in 68. We've got the footage. He's saying the way you're living here is a crime. And King says they're gonna occupy Washington DC, right? Until um, really justice rolls down like a mighty stream. He's gonna be assassinated Thursday, April 4th at 6 p.m. Memphis time before this happens. And I want everybody to know the assassination is not a coincidence. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a coincidence. It's not like, oh my gosh, he just, he tripped and he fell. He's assassinated with a high powered rifle uh, and, and, a, and a bullet that enters his face uh, uh, on Thursday uh, evening, um, um, April 4th, 1968. And this is really important. He was helping 1,100 sanitation workers who were striking for a living wage. So the same, we're talking about $15 an hour now, which is really still not a living wage, but we're talking about 15 an hour. We, we were, we've been talking about a living wage for decades and decades. And King was talking about a universal basic income. King talked about food justice and protesting at the Department of Agriculture um, um, once they got to Washington, D.C. and got to Resurrection City. And one of the things King tells the Black folks in Marx, too, is that um, uh, during the 19th century, the Homestead Act gave millions of free acres to white, uh, white immigrants and European settlers and nativists. And he says that Black folks did not receive 40 acres and a mule, but these white folks got all this land. And what we got was sharecropping and peonage and violence, convict lease system. But then he says something really important. He says, these are the same people telling you to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, right? And then he pauses and says, this is what we're facing. So King understood, even though Malcolm understood it earlier. And that's why I always get that what we were facing was a real tragic evil, a tragic dimension of, of, of humanity um, as it comes up in the United States and sort of this grotesque, uh, this grotesque uh, nature of, of uh, American democracy, you know, where, where it's rooted in white supremacy and it's rooted in this lie that black people are subhuman and they can be subjugated and they can be murdered and they can be exploited and they can be criminalized and brutalized and punished and, 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 and dismissed and demonized. Um, Malcolm always knew that because he had experienced it. That's why experience, they always tell us experience is our best teacher, right? And that's why it's hard to be a parent because you you can see you can see you see, you can see around curves and corners in ways your kids can't. And it's not because you're you're so special, but you've experienced it. So you could you could tell your your daughter, your son, hey, I, I wouldn't do this, right? As they're growing older and older, because you've got experience. And and Malcolm had the experience that King um, eventually gets. King eventually gets. Uh, because King can't believe the level of hate that he receives after coming out against the Vietnam War. Let me tell you something. Malcolm could, okay? King can't believe it, but Malcolm could. Because uh, Malcolm uh, isn't trusting uh, uh, in, in the beneficence of American democracy or Americans, period, right? Because he's lived in the belly of the beast. He's lived in the bowels of, of, of American democracy. And that's why he's always saying this so-called democracy. My favorite quote from Malcolm is when he says, democracy is something that Black people have never had, they don't have, and never will have. That's what, that's what, that's what Malcolm X says, right? And again, He's, he's speaking truth to power, right? And it's important for us to, um, to get that and utilize that, those lessons for, for our own time. Dr. Jones, as you say that, um, I actually was wondering about how religion also led to the transformation that you're speaking of in each of the leaders. And what also ultimately you describe as a combining force for what is Black dignity and then citizenship that becomes manifest in Black power, right? So tell us a little bit more about religion, transformation, and then importantly, how the two land in what is the conceptualization of Black power and its meaning for the liberation of Black people. Yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Nunnally, religion is huge for both of these uh, figures. Uh, I think what I try to do in the Sword and the Shield is show that Malcolm was always a Muslim. I think we um, uh, we do a disservice to the Nation of Islam by calling them Black Muslims. C. Eric Lincoln called them that. They never called themselves that. 
Uh, they are Muslims. They're a different sect than what people call Orthodox. And he becomes uh, a Sunni Muslim um, and takes the Hajj in 1964. Um, but his Muslim um, religion and his belief in Islam is really huge and unequivocal. And so in that sense, uh, it's transformative for him to become a member of the Nation of Islam and to leave Malcolm Little behind and become Malcolm X. Uh, but, you know, we could see that Malcolm lives it. Malcolm lives an ascetic lifestyle. Um, it's really just him and Betty Shabazz, his wife, um, against the world and doesn't let anybody ever enter their marriage or enter uh, their personal private space in any kind of untoward way. So Malcolm X really walks the talk. You know, Malcolm walks the talk uh, in every way. And so when we think about the religion of Islam, Malcolm sees that as a peaceful religion, but a religion uh, that is contrasting his vision of Christianity, which he says is a religion of slavery, suffering, and death, right? And that's what the Nation of Islam said. Um, when we think about Dr. King, and, and one thing about Malcolm too, before moving, is that Malcolm, his trips overseas, 1959 and then 1964, really let, lets him see uh, this idea of, of building this sort of global Islamic community um, that is both religious, but also secular. So Malcolm sees himself as a religious leader, but also this secular leader. And the reason why he starts saying that whites can be part of the solution, he's really trying to make a claim that whites who are open to, to Islam and the Islamic faith uh, and, and the precepts of the Islamic faith and this idea of humanity uh, and human rights um, could be part of the solution. So that's important to remember too. Um, when we think about, uh, and that's why Malcolm also becomes this whole third world revolutionary where he's saying, yes, he's a revolutionary pan-Africanist, but the third world, uh, so he can include um, folks in the Middle East and folks who are from Arab nations and from different nations who are part of this pan-revolutionary um, um, movement. So it's important um, there. Uh, and in a lot of ways, Malcolm, you know, he anticipates both the fact that the United States is going to have uh, many more Muslims, but also the Islamophobia that the United States has um, too, because so many Muslims are people from so-called darker nations, as Malcolm would put it, right? And I think King's Christianity is really vital, but I think it's important to remember King is rooted in the social gospel, the black social gospel. Um, um, there's a great book about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and, uh, the, and, and, and white supremacy by um, Gary, I'm losing Gary's last name, who, who just came out. It's a really great book on the last third is King in the social gospel, but the first two thirds are looking at the black social gospel. And it's really important because when we think about that black social gospel tradition, it's a tradition of different black um, men and women who reinterpret and reimagine um, scripture in ways that really led to black liberation theology, you know, uh, because the first iteration of that is the black social gospel where you're saying, hey, what's going on in the New Testament has to happen now. We have to be anti-poverty, anti-racist, pro-social justice right here on earth. Right. Um, and there's a white social gospel tradition, too, but the black social gospel tradition centers anti-racism. Right. And so in a lot of ways, I think what you're saying, Dr. Nunnally, is exactly right. When we think about religion and black power in the context of black liberation theology, you see that fusion of Christianity, but also I think um, aspects of what's actually going on in Islam, too, in terms of being very, very proactive, <clears throat> nonviolently but proactive, right? So you can think about these ideas of, of uh, uh, that we, we, we've now really distorted um, um, and, and these phrases that people use uh, that are connected to the, to the Muslim world. Um, a, a lot of these concepts are about um, nonviolent political transformation that certain actors have, have transformed with violent actions and people talk about extremism and different things like that. But the, the, you know, calling, calling that uh, the Muslim faith is the same as if we call um, Christian conservatives or evangelical Christians Christianity, right? It's, it's a strain, it's a strain. They are not really representative of um, what I think is Christianity as a Christian, but I know that branding wise, people definitely will say the religious right, the moral majority. Do I think that, it's religion um, in terms of Christianity that they're articulating? Not at all, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Not at all. So I, I think by the time you're anti-reproductive rights, pro-death penalty, and you hate black people, that's got nothing to do with God or Jesus or anything. You know what I mean? And so it's the same there. So that kind of gets distorted. But I think black liberation theology is the sweet spot where it all sort of comes together in terms of the, the black dignity and citizenship. Oh, uh, Dr. Nunley, you're, yeah, you were muted. <laughs> I realized the time, this has been a great discussion. Um, the timeliness in thinking about leadership and where we are in a question of what might be considered black leadership. Is this something that we see evident today? And if so, how? And importantly, how can we reflect upon the Black Lives Matter movement and how leadership has spawned within that movement and what leadership has meant? How does it fare as far as what we've seen historically in black leaders. I think there's a great book here, Barbara Ransby's Making All Lives, all, Making Black Lives Matter, All Black Lives Matter is a really great book here. And I've taught that book because uh, in a way what Barbara Ransby does in that book is provide a sketch of both uh, the, the current extent um, BLM movements uh, and, and iterations and movement for black lives, but also um, looking at um, different earlier iterations in the 1970s and 1980s of black feminist organizations. Uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor's new um, edited anthology of, uh, of the Combi River Collective is very, very important here. The work of Barbara Smith is very, very important here. So in a lot of ways, what we're seeing with, with black leadership is um, we've seen this renaissance of black leadership that in a lot of ways um, owes um, that renaissance to the work of, of, of radical black women and radical black feminist um, women uh, who've been talking about, basically when you think about intersectionality, it's really what King was saying, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So a lot of ways black feminism, yes, it's about elevating black women and being there for black women and showing up for black women, but it's also about um, trying to eradicate systems of injustice everywhere, right? And so I think the leadership we're seeing, which we had always seen, but we're seeing it elevated is all around us. So we have um, hundreds and thousands of just Ella Bakers and Fannie Lou Hamers around us. Some of them are intellectuals and, 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 and scholars like yourself, Dr. Nunnally. Um, but but uh, some of them, you know, Tamika Mallory, Patrice Khan Colors, Patrice Colors, who I teach, uh, 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 Alicia Garza, um, no name. Um, there's so many different people who've been connected to the Dream Defenders, connected to Movement for Black Lives, uh, uh, Sherilyn Eiffel. Um, you know, there's so many folks, both in the United States and Great Britain. So I think we've seen um, Black feminism and Black feminism talking about intersectional justice and just talking about, I think Malcolm and Martin talked about intersectional issues and Black feminists have talked about intersectional identity and fusing them. So thinking about how class impacts our race, uh, it impacts um, our gender, it impacts our geography, mobility, our able-bodiedness. Um, obviously the work of people like Beth Ritchie and uh, Patricia Hill Collins and Patricia Bell Scott and Gloria Hull and Barbara Smith uh, and Tony K. Bambara, but activists too, like Fran Beal, you know, Fran Beal and Gwen Patton, uh, the Third World Women's Alliance, um, who I wrote about in my dissertation and my first book. I mean, there's so much going on here, but, but the leadership, Ayanna Presley, uh, I think AOC has been extraordinary, Corey Bush from Missouri now. So we have so many Black women who are organizing uh, they voted, I mean, exit poll data, 91% for Biden versus 82% for Black men. Not sure if that exit poll data is going to stay, but it's important because on one level, Black women are doing better social economically than, than Black men. They're graduating from high school. They're graduating from college better. On another level, they're disproportionately uh, burdened uh, because of the huge wealth gap. Black women disproportionately head households that are living right below uh, both below the poverty line and right above the poverty line, disproportionately as single-headed. My mom 
uh, was a single um, head of family as well. So I, I understand that from experience. So um, um, there are you know over a million black men missing, not just in prison in different places, but just who are out of the picture uh, because of systems of structural racism and violence. And we're also still looking together, both black men and women um, and, and LGBTQIA to try to create um, a post-patriarchal conception of the black family and of, of, of black masculinity and femininity, right? So we can um, uh, both be on the same page, but at the same time, there are gonna be um, uh, struggles that people are doing based on political self-determination that black men and women themselves wanna lead just like LGBTQIA and then struggles where you're gonna converge um, together. And so uh, in a lot of ways, I think this has been a really um, important moment um, to showcase sort of the panoramic nature of leadership, but also just the, the, the breadth and the brilliance of black women's leadership. And, and, and certainly we've seen people at times push back against that ice cube, all these different things trying to negotiate with Trump. Some of that has to do with that black women have been uh, leading and at the table and, and you're just trying to do your mic drop and, and, and sort of, you know, get the, you know, get the photo op and stuff. And it's like, if you really want to help the movement for black lives, there's ways that you can help and you can lead by just supporting black women. You know what I mean? And it doesn't mean that you, uh, the movement's going to lead you behind. It doesn't mean that you, you can't even be a representative spokesperson, but um, it means we're at a different moment. Um, and that's, you know, it's important to recognize the moment and, and uh, how difficult it's been to get to this moment. You made me think about the synergies of leaders and how, who was interacting with Malcolm X and who was interacting with uh, Dr. King, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, I mean, it was fascinating to see people who we may not, in our contemporary time, may not understand were a part of the movement and engaging with these leaders. Can you say a little bit more about that and even what that means for how we're in discourses about Black people and Black politics today? Oh yeah, I mean, this period, and you know, the great book, Eddie Gloud's book, Begin Again, about James Baldwin, um, in his own time in our in, in ours, very, very important. I, I'm teaching that. Um, um, no, I mean, this is, you know, folks like James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, uh, the artists, the intellectuals, um, the soothsayers, the root sayers, they, they're, they're all a big part of that movement. And I think that continues to this day where movements are about um, social and political transformation, but they're also about um, having deep empathy and love uh, for humanity and people. And I think one of the best parts of Malcolm and Martin and how they float in the world is that they really have, you know, the three things I say that they have in common are personal sincerity, uh, political integrity, and unapologetic love for black people, right? And that's very, very difficult to do um, all at all times. My, my daughter's calling me, hold on for one second. <laughs> my kindergarten, I've got to get, get back in a second. Um, um, and they, that, that, that sincerity, integrity, and unapologetic love is very important because what you see, they don't look down upon Black people. They're ready to embrace Black people, including uh, the least of these. You know, the Bible teaches us about the least of these, and they, they really mean it. So King, one of the most beautiful aspects of him is that, you know, there's so many people who want access to Dr. King, poor folks, uh, folks, you know, Mississippi Delta, Alabama Black Belt, but also Chicago, hard places. And King is always, always um, uh, open and, and vulnerable and, and um, deeply compassionate, always, you know? And it's the same with, with Malcolm too. So these folks uh, really, really felt it. They really felt this existential love for Black people. And I think when you see them with you know, Max Roach and Abby Lincoln and, and, and these, these, you know, Maya Angelou, Vicki Garvin. Uh, it's, extra, it's extraordinary because you're like, oh, these are some of my cultural heroes too. Ozzie Davis, Ruby D. you know, um, um, uh, Dr. King uh, loved Nina Simone, 
you know, and these are folks who loved and appreciated them. And I think there was a better understanding in that time that if you're an artist, you've got to let the leaders lead, you know, and that's the same, you know, rappers and different stuff. You're not our leaders, you know what I'm saying? You know, Malcolm X was not this guy who was making platinum albums and at the same time leading Muslim Mosque number seven. And, and Dr. King wasn't a movie star who at the same time led the March on Washington. It doesn't work that way. So what Dr. King and them did and Fannie Lou Hamer and these full-time activists, it allowed artists to participate in the movement, not lead, right? So the problem, you're, you're in jeopardy when P. Diddy is saying he wants to start a third political party. I mean, what planet are we on, right? I mean, you, you got to let the folks who this is their vocation, they're the ones who, who, who help set up the framework. It's not the other way around. You don't follow actors and musicians, right? Jay-Z is not going to get it. That's why I didn't mind when Jay-Z said, hey, what has marching gotten us? Because Jay-Z is not an activist or, or, or this movement um, um, uh, architect, right? So yeah, what, what, when he said that, I was like, yeah, that's wrong, but that's not surprising. He's a rapper and he's an entrepreneur and he's a billionaire, right? So from his perspective, marching and demonstrations were over. You see how that has aged well, right? Since 2018, 19, not, you know, what he did to Callan Kaepernick. It hasn't aged very well, but it's fine that he says that, but it just shows you the danger in, in athletes too should not be our leaders. Muhammad Ali was a symbol, very important figure, but he's not our leader, right? I mean, the leader is the hardcore folks, the leaders of the Kathleen Cleavers and the people who are actually doing the work, right? They're doing the work and they're doing it full time. That's what they do, right? Just like us as intellect, we do this full time as scholars. We're not, we're not um, hedge fund leaders at the same time and we come here, right? We got our venture capital firms and we're, we're professors. Can you imagine? <laughs> Well, I'm looking at the time. It is nine o'clock. My, the time went by very fast. Yeah, it did. And I'm, I'm going to go to my, get, get, get my little one all, all settled in. <laughs> Do you mind if I can check to see if by chance we have maybe one question that could close us out? Oh, sure. So I'll turn to our team to see whether or not that is the case. Well then, with that said, do you have a closeout message for us? Oh yeah, what is no. a take home for us to think? Oh no, absolutely. About? I think for one, I, I, you know, I want to thank uh, Doctors Hall and Dr. Nunnally for for uh, you know the the invitation and everybody who's helped make this happen. Um, I think our take home, especially in the aftermath of this election, uh, and we're going to see you know um, Biden Harris. We got the first black woman vice president um, elect in American history. Uh, I think the end vote tally is going to be over 80 million versus about 75 million for the current president. I think we do have this anti-racist uh, majority and coalition um, that we're trying to build. So I think um, the, the optimist in me uh, sees that we have this generational opportunity um, to really make big and deep uh, structural changes in the United States, irrespective of what people are saying right now uh, in the media about having to reach over to the other side and we have to negotiate with white supremacists. We have to love the hostages, the hostage takers. You know what I mean? You know, you love the, the racial terrorists. Um, we, we have to focus on fundamental change and transformation that's really rooted uh, in, in centering not just anti-racism, but racial justice. Uh, we have to take the cues and the leadership of, of black women uh, who've really been doing this work as, as violent uh, disruptors in their communities, as 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 uh, po policy architects, as 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 uh, healers and innovators, as small business persons and entrepreneurs, uh, uh, as folks leading in terms of wellness, uh, holistically and health, so much um, uh, is coming out of out of sort of the vision and the determination of Black women, whether it comes food justice or the environment or childcare or healthcare or wellness. And so they have a very, very specific role to play in how do we think about policies that are gonna be best for communities? You know, If you work on doing things that are very, very helpful for black women, 
it's really going to um, help all of us. So this becomes the anti Moynihan thesis, right? So instead of saying you hate on black women and say you gotta help the black men, this is saying that by helping black women, you help black men. By helping black girls, you help black boys, right? Uh, it, and I think people know this, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's been hard getting those policies. So I do think we have a generational opportunity to achieve a different country uh, together. I think those of us who are in this space of wanting to do this work, this is an incredible time. I think the only um, tiresome or worrisome part of this is that we're gonna have to be doing this for the rest of our lives. I mean, I think that uh, we were fed a fairy tale that John Lewis fixed it and Fannie Lou Hamer fixed it and Angela Davis fixed it, Shirley Chisholm fixed it, Barack Obama fixed it. Uh, that's not true. you know. So we have to continue to work. My daughter is gonna have to work. Our kids are going to have to work. This is tough. This is really root work that lasts uh, not for just 10 years and we're good. In 2030, racism's over. <laughs> this is, this is uh, just infinite. It's an infinite struggle. Uh, but that being said, we've made real headway this year with the BLM protest, the George Floyd protest. COVID-19 has really uh, uh, obliterated our illusions about uh, equity and equality. And we see how disproportionately it's hurt black and brown, Native American, indigenous communities. So um, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm definitely confident that we can do it. But we have to, um, we have to center uh, black dignity and black citizenship. We have to center black women. We have to center those who are queer. We have to center the least of these within our communities, HIV positive, cash poor, people who are marginal. There's 37 million Americans uh, who are hungry every day. Uh, including a, a disproportionate amount of black folks. We have to center Medicare for all if we do that. We help black women, we help black boys, we help black girls. We've never had healthcare as good as Medicare. That's basically the healthcare that professors get, Medicare for all, if we had that. So it's really important, like all these things that we're doing, it's really important. And it's important that we have to, again, move away from uh, violent uh, depictions of what liberation is gonna look like in the sense that liberation is gonna be uh, black people enjoying the same kind of uh, patriarchal uh, domination and madness as our white counterparts. That's not liberation, that's not freedom, right? So we have to think and reimagine how liberation and freedom is gonna look. And as men, as straight men, uh, it, it's cisgender uh, and other men, we, it, liberation can't, can't um, mean the domination of anybody, your, your children, mm -hmm women, spouse, <laughs> anything. It's, it's got to be freedom for all of us or freedom for none of us. So I do think that what's so exciting is that these notions of reimagining public safe, safety, abolishing prisons, reparations, uh, ending cash bail, uh, freeing all sex workers and prostitutes from prison, uh, all these different things are on the table and I'm excited about that. So it's not just student debt and we're going to help the middle class. We've got to help the poor and the least of these among us. And, and as Black people, we have to make sure that we're not um, following frameworks and paradigms of oppression uh, within our own community, um, internally or externally. We want to be on the side of justice. And, and to do that, we're going to have to uh, uh, listen and learn as well as lead. You said just what came to mind for me and that is also centering this knowledge and what Africana studies also can Absolutely. bear yes. on these Black studies is the key. We couldn't have had this year without uh, Black studies. Um, you know, everybody from Carter Woodson to, you know, Darlene Clark Hine, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, uh, just the whole, the whole works, you know, all the way up to yourself, Keisha Blaine. I mean, we're, we're this is Black, we're, we are Black studies and this is one of the reasons why we're at this critical moment. Like this knowledge matters, like you said, Dr. Nunnally. Dr. Joseph, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. No, it's been my honor. Thank you. This is great. Thank you, Dr. Nunnally and Dr. Hall. Thank you so much. Thank you. And on behalf of Africana Studies, as well as the Generating Justice Initiative with our School of Social Work at the University of Tennessee, we thank you. We thank you for your time and all of your knowledge and contributions to this important work. Thank you. And I love the title, Generating Justice. I love it. And everyone, thank you for joining us as well and have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Hall.